today uh, we shall discuss an important topic which is called as selective leaching or also called as de-alloying, sometimes they call as partitioning. They, they all mean the same. Now, why does the problem of selective leaching occur in the first hand? Why does really it happen? It happens because it is concerned with the alloys. They are not concerned with the pure metal, they are concerned with, with alloys. Some examples uh, if you want me to give, you can say that copper zinc, copper nickel, they are well known examples. Now, the question is why do you really need an alloy? Why not we use a pure metal? Strength is a consideration, right. So, the strength is a consideration why we go for alloys. I give, want to give an example in relation to copper zinc and copper nickel. Now, if you take a let us say a material and then the properties and the properties uh, what are the properties the mechanical properties may be the yield strength, the ultimate tensile strength and you look at the elongation is the percentage elongation. Um, the units of that can be mega Pascal and you can see the you can appreciate how the alloying helps to improve the mechanical properties. Suppose you take a, a annealed copper. Annealed pure copper, hmm. copper is, is very pure. If you look at the, the mechanical properties, the, the yield strength of that is oddly 33 mega Pascal, the ultimate tensile strength is 209 mega Pascal, the percentage elongation is about 60. If you take a commercial pure, copper, take this, the strength increases considerably. Of course, the strength and the elongation are many times inversely related to each other. But you take a brass which is a brass which is a copper 35 percent zinc which is a annealed annealed right. You will see the strength increases quite significantly. In this case, um, even the elongation also is improving in this case. Hmm. If you take let us say copper 10 percent tin, take this, you can see that the strength level is again increasing and like this. If you look at the copper nickel, you know the alloy systems say copper 10 percent nickel, I am talking about 8 percent, the strength level is the 
yield strength is 105 and the UTS is um, 275. The ductility varies depending upon cold worked or not, it can vary from 15 to 35, you know, depending upon how they are done, it can vary quite widely. If you increase the nickel content further, say 30 percent nickel, see again there is an increase in the strength level, again it can vary in the range something like that. So, in essence we go for alloys because we want to improve the mechanical properties especially strength of the metal. But if you look at this we have seen earlier when you talk about the galvanic corrosion, when you have copper, when you have zinc as two different entities a copper block and a zinc block. If you couple them galvanically in the environment, what is expected to happen? The zinc will corrode preferentially, it becomes an anode, and the copper will act as a cathode. So, the active metal dissolves and the noble metal gets protected. They are macroscopic, there is a clear entity of a copper block and a clear entity of zinc block. Between these two, the current flows, right? Copper acts as a cathode and zinc act as anode the current is flowing between the between them. But in a alloy let us take a copper 35 percent um, zinc which could be in a homogeneous alloy we will talk about it later. They mix it at atomic level right they are homogeneously dissolved and more so in the copper nickel systems right. The copper nickel system is known for having extended solid solubility. So, at atomic level they mix very nicely, but even then the electrochemical property of copper is different from the electrochemical property of zinc or the electrochemical in the case of uh, brass and in the case of uh, copper nickel alloy the nickel is different from that of copper. So, you could able to see having a different electrochemical properties and so you expect at atomic level exhibiting different corrosive behavior with respect to two different alloying elements. So, that is why we talk about selective leaching or we call about the de alloying. Now, To just give an example, how the system can become complicated, let us take this the phase diagram. This is a famous um, copper uh, zinc phase diagram, I think most of you might have studied. Uh, in a physical metallurgy course and you will see a lot of peritectic transformations we call it. The copper zinc system they exhibit different phases right. When the zinc content is, is less you have an alpha phase as you increase the zinc content what happens now you can get a beta phase somewhere here the composition lies between them you get alpha plus beta phase. Of course, you have a gamma phase, you have epsilon phase, you eta phase and so on and so forth. From the point of view of real engineering applications, the alpha phase and alpha plus beta phases are important. We call them as alpha brasses we call them as alpha plus beta brasses, 
we call them as the beta process the most metal. So, these are all very familiar with you. What I want you to understand is the amount of zinc varies depending upon the type of brass that you take. Now, why you take different brasses? Because they have different mechanical properties. The alpha plus beta brass will have a different mechanical properties. In fact, it could be much harder as compared to alpha brass. So, from the structural point of view, we need to use a different type of alloys, which means they have different electrochemical corrosion properties. So, that is the crust of the matter. Now, these are some examples. You can also have various other alloy systems, you know, and these processes are classified depending upon which element is selectively dissolving, selectively leaching. In a copper zinc system, you expect what which one will, will, will dissolve first selectively? Zinc will dissolve and you call them as de zincification a very familiar term. In the case of copper nickel, we call them as de nickelification. You may have somewhat similar to copper aluminum, in aluminum can be with <coughs> even other other uh, allowing elements you can have, you call them as D alumification. Okay. Suppose you have silicon, we call D and so on and so forth. These elements are selectively dissolved because they are relatively anodic compared to the the next element. Sometimes selective dissolution, preferential dissolution is, is beneficial right. What example? Iron chromium, it is beneficial. Why they form the passive films? Okay. So, so you need to contrast. You need to contrast, and how this really is happening. Now, in order to use this alloys, let's say copper zinc, copper nickel, and whatever alloys that we talk about, we need to understand the concept of selective leaching or de alloying we call it in terms of mechanisms, in terms of the factors that affect the de alloying actually. And if you know both of them, then you can able to you know devise means to control de alloying actually. So, what we will do is we will discuss now in terms of how this mechanism of of de alloying occurs. There are about four different types of theory important theories I would say. One dissolution redeposition mechanism the second is volume diffusion the third we talk about surface diffusion The fourth, we talk about percolation model. I 
I will be uh, very brief uh, in discussing uh, these mechanisms ok and they are, they are fairly simple uh, they are not really that 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 complex. Let us look at the the first mechanism we talked about dissolution and redeposition. Let us take the case of brass a copper zinc in the system in this alloy is exposed to the environment. We consider that both the alloying elements they undergo dissolution or corrosion process like this this is your uh, step number 1. Okay. The step number 2 what is expected to happen here is now look at this you can have look at this in this solution your copper ions and zinc ions the copper ions the copper copper 2 plus equilibrium is nobler compared to zinc zinc 2 plus equilibrium right. So, you have copper ions here this copper ions would displace zinc ions or uh, zinc in the lattice. So, you have copper coming over as a copper here and over here. So, you see now the copper ions in the solution will undergo a cementation process we call it right we call it cementation process wherein the zinc transfers the electrons on to copper ions and the copper ions get deposited the zinc dissolves as zinc 2 plus ions. So, this is your step 2 process. C 2 plus is in the solution. Yes, see I put it pictorially like this. Okay. Initially both the dissolve. Right. Of course, it does not go from the bulk, it goes from the surface, ok, it goes to the surface. Then what happens now? What happens in this case? you have copper ions they get exchanged that leads to copper here, copper here you have again copper here zinc, copper zinc so on right. So, this is what is the displaced. So, it is from solution, the solution consists of copper ions, the copper ions being noble they replace zinc from the lattice of the alloy ok and the copper is getting redeposited. And you will form a porous structure, you see look at now it forms a, a porous structure, it is not going to be a, a complete you know a normal metallic structure. If this is the case, um, you know this, this is one, one, one mechanism that we talk about right is one mechanism and uh, this theory has some limitations. For example, suppose you have copper gold for example or you have gold silver. 
into noble. So, it, it, it need not get you know and uh, and in this case look at this in this case the gold may not dissolve. right only copper may dissolve only silver may dissolve because copper is quite noble right suppose i take i give you a copper gold alloy system and put it in environment not necessarily that copper dissolve i'm sorry not necessarily the gold dissolves like you have copper dissolution in the brass system because gold is noble in this case so without dissolution of the noble metal is possible only the active metal can dissolve right. So, so this in this case what happens now it is saying in this case it talks about the dissolution of only the active metal the noble metal need not dissolve from the surface ok. So, it is a really a selective dissolution and not a redeposition process do you understand the thing now. So, so it is it is so this mechanism may not be valid in a system like that simply copper can dissolve and and this can dissolve it is done also you know you know how people how, how does the goldsmith separate uh, you know uh, the gold right the gold has got copper uh, and uh, and gold right the ornament for example how does it separate it takes this one and melts with the <coughs> silver and then forms an alloy and then pours it into the aquarius solution what happens now? Only silver comes out, ok. Copper, of course, comes out, gold does not dissolve at all. So, you can have a set to dissolution process wherein noble metal need not dissolve actually, ok. So, this mechanism does not explain in those metals where uh, those alloys where the noble metal will not dissolve at all. So, there is no question of redeposition process. So, you have the, 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 the second mechanism which it talks about the volume diffusion. Please understand the remaining three mechanisms we talked about the volume diffusion, surface diffusion, the percolation model may not invoke <laughs> the dissolution of the noble element of the alloy it could say that only the active element dissolves the noble element does not dissolve in the system ok. Now, if that is the case suppose I have a bulk alloy let us say it consists of say copper and gold something like that. In the surface see you have a surface here in the surface it is possible that only copper comes out and gold get enriched right. So, it is a selective dissolution of the relatively active metal active element and no metal does not dissolve huh? So, only copper comes out gold remains on the surface and there is a problem here can you tell me what is the problem? The problem is that you know the diffusion of the elements at ambient temperature is so low right. If this process has to continue unless the copper comes to the surface it is not possible for the de alloying to continue am I right. For the de alloying to continue the copper from the lattice has to diffuse and then come to the surface and then only there can be de alloying. If it does not happen a few atomic layers of the alloy will dissolve where the, the relatively active metal post solution 
and then then after there will be no dealloying taking place. Because the diffusivity is low at ambient temperatures. You might have heard of high temperature oxidation right, there you talk about diffusion of aluminum, diffusion of chromium to surface, diffusion of silicon to surface, get oxidized forms an ice protective film and all possible, but at ambient temperature the diffusion of these elements are so low you do not expect them to continue with the dissolution process. But however, what people have done they have noticed that when there is a dealloying taking place, people have observed change in the phases. For example, if I take copper zinc system, I take zinc rich alloy, I take zinc rich alloy ok and when it dissolve, when it dissolve what happens? Just look at the phase diagram here, right. If I take an epsilon alloy here, then the surface will be alpha, then alpha plus beta, beta, beta plus gamma, and gamma plus um, yeah, gamma. So, it will go this way, right, because if you remove zinc from surface, you will get more rich copper rich phase, right. So, copper will I mean the, 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 the brass will have copper rich on the surface because zinc is removed. So, as you move from the surface to the bulk, the phases will be alpha, alpha plus beta, beta, beta plus gamma and gamma and so on and so forth, is not it? That is how it happens. So, that is how people have detected in some cases to show that there is a selective dissolution of these elements, but however, the thickness of these layers are so small. So, this theory is little bit a problem, but of course, they have proposed what is called as die vacancy theory they say that if you have two vacancies together it is easy to to migrate so that's the theory that have been proposed but it is uh, not been well proven across various alloy systems okay so the volume diffusion is considered to be more difficult and uh, it is not uh, be very favorable for dealloying of various metals. There is something called as as um, surface diffusion mechanism. This is very interesting. Now, I have a surface and I get d alloyed, it is a d alloyed surface ok. A d alloyed surface, when it d alloyed then what will happen to, to the surface, surface will be rough and porous there will be atoms loosely held right. Now, these atoms migrate through diffusion process because when the atoms are alone the energy of the atom because surface becomes quite large right. So, when the energy of the surface is more than what happen they try to they try to uh, agglomerate they try to agglomerate actually. So, what happen they they migrate diffusion process and then form islands of noble metal clusters noble metal you will see porous structures huh? porous you see pits. So, the initial process is the active element dissolves, the noble element remains on the surface, but subsequently what happens? The noble elements, the, atom, the, the atoms 
they diffuse on the surface and they form clusters. In the process what happens? You are going to generate a free surface again am I right? You can create a free surface because the atoms are moved and formed as a clusters. So, it creates a free surface that again again leads to d alloy. So, this is I have been people have been modeling this and then and then trying to show that uh, the, the the dissolution is um, is by clustering process. People have shown a uh, nano structures, people have shown the porous structures ok and um, and and that is how uh, you know um, and the, the de-alloying continues it is it is it is it is not just the surface process it can go subsurface process. So, um, so surface diffusion process is a result of de-alloying of the active element the clustering of the atoms because of the surface energy leading to creation of the fresh surfaces and subsequently again there is a de-alloying and the process continues and de-alloying happens uh, eventually to a larger thickness in the in the alloy right. Um, there is a small variation in this um, in this concept this is called as percolation. You know what is called percolation right this this model probably many many of you might have studied uh, you know and, and various context of that. You take a solid containing A and B, any entities that you have, you mix them thoroughly, right. You mix them thoroughly. Suppose assume that A is the major element and B is a minor element, right. You mix them thoroughly, the B's can come in contact with each other when you exceed the concentration of B beyond a level right. Do you, do you get it? So, when I when I when I when I have A and B I mix it you know if the if the, if the a content of B is very low then the all B are isolated ok or all the B are surrounded by A actually, but if you keep on increasing B at one level B and B <coughs> will come in contact with each other ok. So, that is so that means that makes a continuous path for the B to dissolve am I right when the B and B are coming in contact with each other then it is not dissolving actually. So, the percolation model tells that beyond certain concentration the de-alloying occurs. This is a very interesting uh, theory. For example, take copper and zinc less than 18 percent of zinc no de-alloying. If you increase the zinc content beyond that the de-alloying occurs. So, the, the percolation theory talks about the active elements coming in contact with each other. So, that the dissolution path is quite continuous right it goes like that. But please notice that the percolation model and the diffusion model can work together right. I can have I can have some threshold level of active element that leads to dissolution, but even then there can be diffusion of the noble element in the surface. So, that they can form clusters. So, the percolation model does not totally exclude the surface diffusion model actually right. So, it is quite possible. So, the percolation model explains why you need 
critical concentration of alloying element in order to get the dealloying. Without that, it won't happen, right? So that is a important thing when we talk about the dealloying of materials. Actually, okay. So we'll talk about the factors affecting dealloying, you know, shortly. Okay, but these concepts are important in order to understand the factors that control the dealloying of the metals and alloys. Okay. Is, is it clear now actually? So, we so far saw four theories, one involving that both the noble element and the active element they dissolve in the first instance and subsequently the noble element what happens? It, it deposits back onto the surface and it displays you know and then the active element goes to solution right. This called displacement process. Very true, yes. So, why is not that DLOing happening? How is this uh, theory accounting happening? Um, the, the you, you are saying that why do you need a percolation model, right? This is what you are saying. Yeah, because right? zinc here is uh, active, it has it, it had to uh, dissolve, not deposit like on the surface, copper used to uh, move around and then form pits. Yeah, yeah. See now, now look at the model. For example, the DLIing model. I mean, in the in the redeposition model that we talk about, it is simply that at one go, both the elements dissolve and they get redeposited into the system, right? In which case, irrespective of the amount of alloying element added, right? What I mean, talk about concentration of element, right? The dealloying should should continue to happen, right? It does not happen if you have uh, copper zinc, but it is 18 percent or you know famous red brass. Red brass you do not get dealloying, we will we'll see later. Yellow brasses occur, okay. The yellow brasses and red brasses are all alpha brasses, but then the amount of zinc in red brass is only 15 percent. So, 15 percent zinc does not lead to dealloying. Any amount of time you expose to the environment, nothing happens, okay. So, how can you explain that? The only way that you can explain is that you need a critical concentration in order that the DLIing occurs. Now, the critical concentration how much is required that also will depend upon what? It may depend upon temperatures, it may depend upon the environment, it may depend upon the two alloying elements. For example, if the alloying elements have wider potential difference, right, then the critical concentration may come down also actually, okay. The factors that you see little later. So, yes, they are all going to decide what is the critical concentration a threshold concentration above which the DLIing occurs, okay. But these factors are to be taken into account which that is what we are going to see in the subsequent discussions. So, the percolation model explains the need to have critical concentration of the active element in order to have DLIing process that is that is what the, uh, the discussion all about actually, okay. Um, and the, the surface diffusion model is also proven because when you take out and see there are islands you know there are islands and there are you know we are not going details. If you look at the R C Newman's work and all you know they, they are shown very clearly there are nano grains there actually okay. How you get a nano grains? They get nano grains because these atoms are get clustered and form the nano grains actually okay. So, the clustering they do happen. Okay, and then since the nano grains are porous and then there is a continued dissolution of the metal really taking place at all. So, this 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 is this, this um, so what is after all mechanism? The mechanism is what we propose in order to explain the observations that are taking place right. So, that is what it is it, all about actually and then these mechanisms should also explain the, the fundamental processes that are taking place. For example, when you say volume diffusion there is the issue there, the issue there is that how much what should be the thickness over which this can happen. So, this can happen. So, they also used a theory called as divaxin theory, but then 
still is very limited we cannot have uh, extended de-alloying of metals it cannot take place at all actually. So, that is why the you know the the the, the volume diffusion was put forward by uh, Howard Pickering you know in his, his own papers. So, you see some papers appeared in corrosion science long ago very nicely demonstrated that there are you know if you see the surface as I told you the volume diffusion is what when you de-alloy it the surface will have the least amount of active element as you move inside the active element concentration increases right that is what it that is why it is called volume diffusion of taking place right. And so, that is yes, proved is shown it by using electron diffraction pattern that these phases are changing from surface to this. But the, the, the thickness over which they are happening are very limited and taking place at all. So, each of these theories is not that as though that there is no um, evidence, but there are limited amount of evidences and each theory have their own limitations to explain the completely absorbed phenomena in the dealing of the metals actually. Okay. I hope I, I have made the made the point uh, clear to you in terms of um, uh, you know these models in explaining de alloying of, of metals. Any other questions you have? Okay. So, let us move on to the next one actually ok. What are the factors controlling Now, this is called as partitioning right. The partitioning will depend upon element A which is noble I call it potential of the noble element and the potential of the relatively less noble element we call as active element ok. I do not call anode and cathode active element right. If the delta E is, is equal to E n minus E a is large, then the alloying increases. What does it mean? You take copper zinc and you take take copper zinc and copper nickel. If you make if I make a, a tube for a heat exchanger that carries uh, sea water one one case it is copper zinc other case is copper nickel both cases sea water will be used which of the two tubes will fail earlier copper zinc will fail earlier ok this is what I meant here. So, because the potential difference between these two are quite large as compared to this. And secondly is the composition. Higher the content of the active element more is the de alloying. right. Say an example copper let us say um, 18 percent zinc copper let us say um, 30 percent zinc and copper 40 percent zinc. This is uh, this both are called alpha brasses, right? And this is called the beta brass. This is called the Moon's metal, right? The Moon's metal, famous Moon's metal, is copper, uh, forty percent zinc, right? So the de alloying will increase from this to this and to this. Am I right? Because the delta E is going to be the same, you know, in all cases, but the content of the active element increases from this to this to this actually. Similarly, you can also have copper 10 percent zinc uh, sorry nickel 
and copper 30 percent nickel. The question then you will ask is why would people use alpha beta brasses? In sea water people use alpha beta brasses, why they use? Because the alpha beta brasses they have better erosion corrosion resistance, they have better mechanical properties. So, the damage mechanism need not be always de alloying, it can be simultaneous process when there is a flow line, there is velocity, you can have de alloying, you can also have erosion corrosion. If the erosion corrosion is more dominating, then what happens? Then you will see that copper 18 percent zinc will be failing faster than copper 30 percent zinc, because copper 30 percent zinc has got better mechanical properties. So, so you need to look at overall perspective in terms of the metal selection alloy selection for given applications, ok. But what we are seeing here is understanding the signs of de alloying. So, that I think you should you should try to understand. Now, in addition to this, it also depends upon the environment. More oxidizing environment, more oxidizing, more corrosive, more de alloying. An example is chlorination. People do chlorination in, in cooling water systems, and if you do chlorinate, chlorine is an oxidizer and so the more de alloying occurs. Let me look at a slightly um, uh, you know uh, more related to alloy, alloy chemistry towards the to the to the de alloying ok. Let us take that I have element A and B, B is active. Okay. So, the B concentration increases as you go from this curve, curve 1 to and 3 the concentration of the active element increases. Now, they show some kind of passivity and you have a potential here and uh, this is the uh, potential we call it ok, we call the potentials and this is called as E c beyond this selective leaching occurs. So, there is a driving force for corrosion to occur right. So, for these alloys uh, in order to find out whether they are undergo de alloying how effective they are you can carry out a polarization uh, curve ok. And, and get this uh, and find out what is the E c value. E c here represents the potential above which the de alloying really occurs. And uh, the increase in passive current density here so called passive current density means that there is more de alloying is taking place. Now, if the corrosion potential exists above E c if E car is going to be greater than or equal to E c, then what happens? D alloying occurs right or not, because only above E c you have D alloying, you get this polarization curves. So, how do you get how do you get E car at that particular value? What is the basis? When will the E car will go here? Yeah, in actual situations when do you expect that will happen? What is the criteria for that? 
yeah that is right you, you call it transpassive I do not want to call this a transpassive here you know we call here this potential above which there is a DRI taking place. When will the E car I mean E car will go above this or what? So, so it depends upon the reducing reaction right you have one more reaction this is the anodic reaction you have a cathodic reaction if the cathodic reaction if the kinetics support that suppose I have this is for cathodic reaction you cannot happen. But if the cathodic reaction occurs somewhere here what happens the E car is going to lie above the E C. So, you are going to have D alloying here no D alloying here. So, th what I mean is the environment also is important the environment is less oxidizing then the D alloying will not takes place at all ok. And this this concept we have seen it so many number of times you know how the E car really occurs. E car is a mixed potential right mixed potential means it is both on the anodic as well as the cathodic kinetics ok. So, it depends on the alloy it depends upon the environment as well that is the point that you need to be understanding at all. Now, the E C of course, it depends upon what depends upon the alloy here right if you the E C will, will will keep reducing if you are going to alloy more and more um, uh, active element in system. Yeah, it is not pitting here you do not see pit here in this case that is why in, in, in copper uh, in a copper zinc system and copper nickel system you do not get a pit at all actually ok. The, if, you, if you if you observe the surface here you will see the surface is enriched more with, with what with copper because zinc is just getting out of it. Similarly, copper nickel also nickel comes out of solution. In fact, if you take if you take a copper nickel system if you carry out a polarization here and see the solution the solution color will turn into green why that more nickel is getting dissolved. So, you see a nice green coloration at this particular potential you will not see you may see nickel also here, but then the amount of coloration you see very very small here. So, that is way you can able to show that nickel is uh, preferentially dissolving over this particular potentials ok. Hope this point uh, is, is, is clear to you. Now, we have seen these things so, what does it really means in practical applications ok. Application where are these problems? I am not sure at what extent you can able to see this uh, picture here ok. Uh, let me try to see you know you see this this black coloration here. Huh? They are greenish black color actually I hope I do not know how far it is able to see. And this is a copper nickel alloy in sea water application in one of the refineries uh, located in, in Mumbai it is about a couple of years uh, you know uh, through through this the water uh, sea water um, you know was passed through this is heat exchanger. Now, you see the coloration here I hope you are able to see this coloration here. So, this is the coloration they will see look at this color you can able to see this color here is bright here right that is and this the black thing that you seeing here is due to the de nickelification the nickel came out of surface and formed this actually here ok. This is something which is uh, which, which, which normally you see. This is another example This is another example of how the de alloying can really affect this is um, essentially it is a it is a de zincification process. The left side what you see you see here this layer is is a de alloyed layer ok you can see this it is it is rich in copper. But look at this this is a layer type here it is something like a pit type you know you see here. So, you can have a two different types of uh, de alloying taking place it depends upon the the alloy it depends upon the environment you know you can have a, you can have a plug type is called a plug type is called a layer type. So, if you have like this please notice now if I remove zinc from brass what will happen what will happen to strength reduce, reduce because that is what is giving point. So, it will the strength will reduce actually ok. And in this case, it not only reduces strength, it also means stress concentration at this kind of pits here. 
ok. So, this is a, the other kind of problem. So, these are the real problem happen, but fortunately they are not the de is not as fast as as your pitting corrosion and all, but yes it does have affect uh, over years ok. And in this case of course, uh, this is an exhalated one uh, acidified copper solution. So, 7 days only, but in practice it may take a couple of years to get the de layers actually on the surface. Is sensitization same as leaching? No, sensitization is not a leaching there right. In sensitization what happens now? In sensitization you are talking about stainless steels right. In stainless steels you are taking the chromium out of the strain boundary area right. So, you are going to have simply iron. So, iron simply dissolves there actually is it not ok. And if you have in fact, it goes other way around. If you are going to have a stainless steel and uh, you know high end and chromium, chromium dissolves preferentially and it forms a nice passive layer, it stops actually. In fact, a sort of selective corrosion is happening in the stainless steels ok. But only thing that happens now, the chromium forms a film. So, it does not allow the subsequently the dissolution of the alloy. So, de in some cases can be beneficial ok, it can help, but in these cases where it is not passivating it is not good because it is going to be reducing the strength of the alloy significantly and cause the problems ok. Yeah. So, applications now you see that you know you have alpha brasses are prone to this to de alloying you know which is of course beyond 18 percent alpha brasses alpha beta brasses and alpha beta brasses all of them are prone to um, de alloying actually what people have done actually in order to avoid this uh, the desinquation process all of brasses you might be knowing what is called as admiralty brass right. Bring people from the navy you knowing is this it is this admiral who first you know formulated this particular alloy actually. So, that is why it is called as admiralty brass. The admiralty brass it consists of tin ok, it has got a tin um, I think it is about um, I think it is about 1 percent I think it is about 1 8 percent yeah. So, but 1 8 percent of tin is added to this ok to alpha brasses. To support this they also add small quantities eight percent of uh, what of arsenic, antimony and phosphorus are added to this and they are effective in curbing the de alloying of alpha brasses. The mechanism is not completely known, this is not known actually ok. There are some speculations, but not completely known, but alpha beta brasses such additions uh, such additions not help. So, they continue to undergo de alloying same as the beta also right. And for most seawater application where you want to really have a safe uh, thing people go for copper nickel systems people go for copper nickel is the sea water people use that predominantly. I will just cover another topic which is relatively um, small and and related to de alloying and uh, this is called as 
graphitic corrosion. Yeah, I mean see in the solid state diffusion of all these elements, uh, you know at ambient temperature is a very, very less, very small right. It is extremely <laughs> slow actually taking place and I do not think zinc also the diffusivity is any significantly higher compared to that ok. So, the, the diffusivity of uh, of, of zinc in, in copper is still is very low. If the diffusion is going to control the de-alloying right, then the rate of de-alloying will be very, very low ok. Now, then how do you explain the rate of de-alloying which is higher ok. So, that is the question that comes now ok. Now, the so the bulk diffusion the volume diffusion model that if you are to account for the rate of de-alloying, it cannot be accounted based on the diffusion uh, you know diffusivity of zinc at ambient temperatures. A bit of uh, you know the the use of the the die vacancy you know that means to say that there are two zinc atoms which are dissolving and creating two vacancies and two vacancies are move little at a faster rate and so, that assists the diffusion you know migration of zinc from the you know from bulk to this that is a speculation that is speculation taking place. Otherwise, simply based on the diffusivity of zinc in the lattice at ambient temperature you cannot account for the rate of de-alloying occurring in process at all this things. So, that is where the volume diffusion theory lacks in explaining the experimental observations. So, we are going to go into surface diffusion because in surface diffusion what happens is you are simply clustering right. The reaction the de-alloying is always happening in the surface only. It is not happening at the bulk. When you have let us say that zinc is coming out and you have copper you may have you know a copper atom which are free atom there actually. They just move and they form islands of copper right, which means they are clustering that means the, the free surface is that. Now, this islands also start growing like you know in two dimensional things now. So, that means you always have created a free surface and through the free surface the de-alloying is taking place. So, there is no bulk diffusion that is accounted for in the surface diffusion process. So, that is why you are able to talk about it and people have done that actually again Newman model yes, yes look at you know Monte Carlo simulation and then you know trying to see how these are happening at all all this they have done it. So, that explains one part of it the other part it does not explain is that why you need a, a threshold level of the active element in the alloy in order to cause the de-alloying that does not really tell ok. That is where the percolation model comes into pictures because you see here what it means is that yeah there can be surface diffusion, but surface diffusion is not enough to account for the, the dissolution rate of it right. So, in addition to this surface diffusion the percolation model which connects the active element in the in the matrix it dissolves and then it goes it connect like this only ok. So, these these are all in fact you would talk about even composites and all you know people talk about composites various properties the electrical properties of the composites for example ok. They are isolated then the electrical property does not happen. Suppose you have element A and element B the element A is insulator and you add element B into the system actually and beyond certain level of B which is conducting element you see a nice conductivity increases because the B is is connecting the each other to the pathways actually. So, this is essentially that you are connecting them and then through the pathway they come as a channel and, and dissolve out of it. So, it is another way of looking at the selected dissolution of of the atoms actually ok. So, so, so they are not isolated. So, percolation model talks about 
critical concentration required for that ok. But all are again related to potential difference related to the environment because the driving force for the corrosion again depends upon the other factors. What the potential variation, the environment that you are going to be here, the e car value that shifts, they are all going to be a part of which talks about the rate of dissolution of the alloying ok. So, these two things should be seen separately, the factors and the mechanism are to be seen you know um, should be properly understood I would say I think ok, that is the thing. Is that answered now your questions ok, any other questions if people have ok. Now, let us go into um, the graphitic corrosion I just want to finish off this year. Um, people have been using cast ions, cast iron pipelines. Those uh, who are not familiar with cast iron, uh, we just spend a minute ok uh, to, to, to get an idea about what it is. What is the difference between a steel and a cast iron? Castable grade. Okay. Oh, so, what is the composition of carbon? From 2 to 4 percentage of carbon or greater than 2 weight percentage. So, more than 2 percent, uh, 2 point something like 4 or whatever kind of weight percent, if the carbon content is going to be there, ok, if the carbon is more than that, you get into cast ions. Can you give a better definition of that? It is right, right. And As of iron, uh, of iron and carbon that can be casted. I can cast eutectic anything I want, I can, I can the cast. The presence of eutectic casings. You are right, yeah. So, in the solidification process, it does not go through from the liquid, it does not go through, it does not go through this, it does not go through <coughs> a gamma transition, right, is not it. If you look at the iron carbon diagram, in all the cases, the liquid directly can give us to what? Give us to? alpha plus F E 3 C you can give right, you can give us ok. You can give alpha and then you can give you give rise to alpha plus F E 3 C. So, it does not go through a gamma in the phase diagram first of all, first thing. The second thing is it can form a cementite form with alpha or it can also form alpha plus graphite. Am I right? Now, of course, there are different types of cast ions, you know, which is uh, very famous gray cast ion, white cast ion, nodular cast ion, or one more malleable cast ion. What is the difference between a malleable cast iron and a, and a, and a nodular cast iron? Anything more? Iron is converted to malleable cast iron by heat treatment process, right? Whereas the the nodular cast iron goes directly from the liquid, you get the graphite actually there ok. And what is the gray cast iron? Here also you get a directly you get a you get a graphite, but the graphite is in what form? It is in the flake form actually ok. Now, you please read those people who have um, want to know more about for example, why should it form F E 3 C, why how is possible for you to uh, move you know without forming F E 3 C, how you can have graphite, what are the additions are added all this you can read some books and uh, you know uh, there are nice books available simple books if people read it. Now, it is important for you to understand the microstructure of cast iron in order to 
in order to understand what is called a graphitic corrosion. This is a gray cast iron right. What do you see these flakes, these flakes are all what these flakes are all graphite right. The matrix is a ferrite alpha matrix this is a gray cast iron. But what you need to know is these flakes they may look a little isolated are they isolated? They are interconnected right these are all something like So, if you have a thickness suppose you have a thickness of the cast iron a flake may start from this end it may end in this end actually right. So, these are all not isolated they are interconnected in the gray cast iron this is a very important thing and uh, for those who have uh, not have an idea about gray cast iron should know this. If you take a, a, a spheroidal cast iron microstacks of this. Please notice these are graphite, so graphite. These graphites are not only spheroids, spherical and what what difference does it make between the gray cast iron and this? They are not interconnected, they are well separated right, they are well separated. That means, each of this are surrounded by the matrix ok, it has got that good mechanical properties as compared to gray cast ions. But anyway we are not going to discuss that that aspect, but these microstructures have relevance for corrosion that I think we should be understanding at all. Please understand you have a graphite in the system, you have alpha in the system which alpha means is iron a little bit of carbon dissolved there ok. And so, that is what you normally see the system. So, what are the consequence of that? this alpha ion the graphite here. I exposed to the environment right as an environment here what happens? What do you think will happen? I have taken this alloy and exposed to the environment may be like sodium chloride pollution or water moisture something like that. So, what do you think will happen? The iron will dissolve preferential why does it happen? Yeah, yeah. So, graphite is noble. So, if you look at the galvanic series, I hope you will be able to recollect the galvanic series we have shown before. Graphite is noble, iron is is active. So, what is going to happen? You are going to have micro galvanic cells. It is not a typical D alloying like what you see in the uh, in your brass or maybe in uh, cupronickel alloy system. Here, there is a distinct graphite phase and there is a distinct uh, matrix of uh, alpha ion and 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 so they have a have a, a, a different um, you know noble and active characteristics and the one which is noble will act as a cathode the one which uh, active will be suffering corrosion actually serious corrosion here. So, what will happen you will see the corrosion occurring in the or the interface the corrosion becomes severe right. In the galvanic corrosion where is the attack more or the interface ok, the interface corrodes. Now, now, the, now it, it corrodes like that if you visualize this. So, what do you have, have will happen here? In this case the corrosion suppose there is the environment here environment the corrosion starts it will proceed like that proceed like this proceed and start leaking here. 
because of continuous thing it leaks. On the other hand, if I take a, a nodular cast iron or a malleable cast iron, if you take a cross section like this, I may have some graphites here, I may have some graphites here, and I have here, here, like this, right. Now, the corrosion will start here, here, start here. Now, what happens? They, they fall off. Now, subsequently, what happens to the galvanic corrosion? It stops. The galvanic corrosion does not proceed further, the micro galvanic corrosion does not proceed further. So, that what happens now that means no graphitic corrosion. Now, the graphitic corrosion that occurs in the uh, in the in the gray cast iron obviously depends on the environment right. So, you see so it is a pipeline it is the soil the soil chemistry becomes important right. You have for example, you have an acidic soil and you have a lot of chlorides the attack becomes more. <laughs> Okay. Um, nowadays, they are not much of a problem because nowadays people do not use gray cast iron that much we have because people have come to know there is a problem. Earlier days when there were pipelines and the pipelines you know in fact, the, the problem started when when they are paving the roads ok. When they start digging the roads the excavator the shock waves that went and you know hit this pipeline caused simply the cracking right. See what happens you know imagine that that I have a dissolution process here what happens now all the iron slowly dissolves there is a residue of graphite just sitting on the surface right. So, it loses its mechanical integrity at all you know and so even a small impact given onto the pipeline it just fractures ok. So, this were the problems uh, you know just after second world war Okay, there are a lot of problems, but nowadays of course, people are uh, very clever they do not use uh, gray cast iron, but it is important for us to understand the science behind this and uh, why we do not use the gray cast iron for many of the pipelines, but cast irons are good. If you compare the cast iron versus the steel generally the cast irons corrode at a lower rate I am talking about uniform corrosion because the cast irons may have some silicon all the stuffs which they are more generally more resistance to uniform corrosion, but if a gray cast iron the problem comes out of the localized attack that happens between the graphite and the iron matrix leading to leaking of the pipelines. People in those days were storing even sulfuric acid you know using the cast iron tanks and sulfuric acid will leak from inside to outside oh, whole structure looks very intact, but it ooze out because uh, the, the, the corrosion occurs between the uh, graphite flake and the and the matrix and so start oozing out from the, the surfaces. So, only way to avoid here is that not to use uh, gray cast iron people use what is called as the malleable cast iron or the uh, nodular cast irons ok. Um, so, that uh, should bring uh, us to the end of the discussion related to the de-alloying and the selective leaching and I want you to go through this and 